Welcome to Convex, where we are celebrating experiment-driven marketing. My name is Mani, and I handle product marketing at VWO. Today, we have with us Elizabeth Romanski, Manager of Consumer Marketing and Analytics at Encyclopedia Britannica. Encyclopedia Britannica, of course, needs no introduction, and it has been at the forefront of information revolution for the past 250 years. I'm very happy to have you with us, Elizabeth, today. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you very much for having me. So before Elizabeth starts her presentation, I want to inform all our viewers that you can join Convex's official LinkedIn group and ask all the questions you might have from this presentation there. With that, Elizabeth, the stage is all yours. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Not many companies can say they have successfully survived the business world for more than 250 years. It's no small feat. It requires constant adaptability, ingenuity, research, drive, patience, and a dose of daring. Encyclopedia Britannica just celebrated its 250th year anniversary last December. And while we may look quite a bit different than we did at our beginning, we have, made, we have remained true to our mission ever since. 1768, and for the next 250 years, we have and will continue to inspire curiosity and the joy of learning in our customers. In order to ensure that we do this, we must always be user focused. Recently, we just reset our assumptions on who our users were and what they wanted from our consumer site, Britannica.com. But our company was founded around the idea of creating a new encyclopedia for the general reader. So we were always user focused, you could say, whether we knew it at the time in those early years or not. In 1768, two entrepreneurs, Colin McFarquhar and Andrew Bell, and one editor, William Smelly, decided to go against the current dictionary and encyclopedic convention by printing the first ever Encyclopedia Britannica. Their goal with this new style of encyclopedia was for it to be more utilitarian for readers. With this first edition, readers could now more quickly than ever find the reference material they were looking for before ever with previous encyclopedias of the time. Unbeknownst to the three at the time, this edition launched a series long journey of edition after edition of Encyclopedia Britannicas. Each one was revamped for accuracy, usability, and authority. The 15th edition, which was first published in 1974, would ultimately be our last edition. In this span of time, the company had undergone acquisitions and growth, and the needs of our users were changing. By the late 1990s, our users had already were going digital, and so were we. We went digital in 1981 with the publication of the first digital encyclopedia in history. And then in 1994, we launched Britannica Online to become the first encyclopedic resource to debut on the internet. Although Britannica has always kept its readers at the forefront, the last 20 years has proven challenging in keeping up with the ever-changing consumer. I think that we can all agree Technology is moving at an incredible pace. In 1999, most people were just fascinated with the internet as just a regular tool. But now it's ingrained in our everyday life and new platforms like voice and AI are becoming even more explored within our digital ecosystem. This is where user and market research along with testing came into play for us. For the last decade, we thought we knew who our readers were. They were intellects, people who wanted to read long articles, gather facts, and learn, and they were willing to spend the time to go through our entire articles, whether in the early years it was print or when we were digital online. Although we thought this, we noticed that our consumers and our analytics of those consumers, we're beginning to tell a very different story. On our consumer site, Britannica.com, we started seeing more and more of our users spending less time on our articles than they ever used to. We realized that now things were changing. 
So we needed to better define who our users actually were. There was an idea that they probably weren't who we thought they were many years before. And equally important to knowing and defining who our users were right now, we also wanted to understand why they were coming to our site because it was clear that consumer behavior was changing and is changing in parallel with the shifts in technology and information landscape. Media is and still or was and still is taking the world by force. In fact, just last year, eMarketer reported that U.S. adults, they spend an average of 6.3 hours a day with digital media. That's insane. So knowing all of this information, we decided we needed to begin a multi-year research project focused on tackling a better understanding of our, who our users were now. We wanted to learn within this project what we were doing well, what we could do better, and what we could potentially create in terms of new products that were aimed at our, to fit our changing consumers' needs. So at the beginning of this project, we had three main goals. The first one was that we needed to better define who was visiting our site, Britannica.com. The second goal was that we needed to understand why they were visiting. And the third goal was we needed to define what they wanted when they arrived to our site. We began creating and posting surveys on Britannica.com. The survey asked questions related to the reason behind their visit to our site, whether they were looking for a specific topic, what amount of information were they looking for when they came to our articles, and whether they had a lot of knowledge about the topic they were researching ahead of time. With this survey, we had over 34,000 respondents from across the globe that responded to our survey. And after analyzing these responses, we were able to categorize them and find several commonalities. We found that 48% of our respondents were academic users. They were coming to our site for schoolwork related to homework, papers, projects, research assignments, studying, all of those. 30% were coming to our site with personal interests or projects. Some were writing books fact-checking things, simply wanting to learn more about something that they loved, and some were even preparing to have conversations with colleagues and family about certain topics they enjoyed to discuss. The remainder of the respondents to our survey were a mix of users who were coming to our site for work, casual interest, or they were very frequent users of our sites. They were kind of our loyalists. In addition to learning who our users were through this survey, we also learned that they felt our content was trusted, our brand respected, and our articles were comprehensive and extensive. All wonderful things to hear from our users. However, most users, mainly those that were falling into that academic group, they weren't reading as many article pages as they used to. In fact, they weren't really reading the article all the way through at all. It wasn't because that we were not providing the answers or content they were looking for, but these users were now wanting to come to a site with a very specific question in mind so that they could get that question answered quickly and move on. They were coming to our articles with the intent of getting quick facts and answers with very minimal reading. This was very crucial insight into the needs of our users, especially for an encyclopedia like us. And we were excited to learn this and very, very eager to start finding a solution for them. Our brains were already worrying with ideas. But before we could immediately begin devoting resources to redesigning all of our articles to suit these user group needs, we knew we needed to take a breath and slow down. After the initial thrill of getting all of these new exciting learnings, we realized there was more information, information and testing that still needed to be done. While we had just identified a user need and a new problem that they found with our articles, we also needed to understand and to better understand what kinds of questions they were coming to our articles 
that they were wanting to be answered. So we then decided to ask those 34,000 survey respondents to now share what they wanted to know about those topics that they had indicated they came to our site to look up. They were given a long form box to list out all of the questions that they had coming to those articles. From this, we collected about 3,000 responses, each that had multiple questions that they had written that indicated what users were wanting to know when they came to specific articles. After sorting all of these and categorizing the questions, we discovered two key things. One, users had a lot of the same questions. And two, these questions were mainly focused on our articles that were about events, places, and our biographies. Some examples of the questions you can see in the slide above, but there were also some other ones like, how many nautical miles is Dunkirk from Dover? What were the causes of the Salem witch trials? And how did William Shakespeare die? The process of sorting all of the submissions of questions told us what our users wanted to know but we now needed to determine how best to deliver these answers to them. So this began a lot of discussion and debate on several different designs that we could use to provide this information to them on our site. But after this, and after all of this debate, we decided on one concept and began to craft our AB test for this project. Now, you may be wondering why we needed to test this concept. I mean, we had already found out from our survey that users wanted quick answers and facts. Wasn't that enough to get started? To answer this, I want to reiterate that these users who responded to this survey only made up a portion of our site's audience. Not everybody who comes to our site responded to our survey. And additionally, those who did respond to our survey, not everyone, only, you know, the majority, they, not everyone indicated that they needed quick answers. And lastly, while users wanted quick answers as a business, we want KPIs like user engagement and page views to be met. So we really had to make sure that we were balancing our business needs in addition to and with our consumers' needs. This section of the project is where BWO came into play. My team uses BWO frequently for a variety of A-B testing needs, and I knew, based on my experience with the tool, that this would be the perfect project to execute it with. We first identified several articles based on some of the most popular articles from the survey to test this new feature on, and then we settled on a main hypothesis along with a few test goals. Internally, this new feature that we were testing was called the Q&A accordion module. As you can see in the screenshot, we had several different variations and the accordion modules had an average of about five questions that users could click on to get answers to. The questions in these modules were specific to the article that they were presented on. And they were questions that were not only generated by our editors and curated, but also ones that some of our users provided that showed that there was a very common interest in that question. For example, as you can see, how William Shakespeare died is a question that we included in this module because it was one that was very commonly asked among those who were surveyed. In our test, we had the main control, which is the article as is on the right, which is William Shakespeare. We also had a variation A, which presented these Shakespeare-specific Q&A accordion modules with just text and additional links to other articles like Anne Hathaway and even jump links or anchor links, I'm sorry, to more about Shakespeare within that article. We then had a second variation B, which had the same kind of basic template, but we also wanted to incorporate images, as you can see in this example, with an image next to the Anne Hathaway link that maybe would entice users and show them kind of what they were getting into when they clicked the link. 10 days, and we had over 11,000 visitors who were a part of this first test on the, the William Shakespeare article. We were measuring with this test engagement with the questions 
to see if A, users even opened up the accordions to view the answers, and B, if these users clicked on any of the inline links to get to other articles. And lastly, C, we wanted to make sure that this accordion module did not adversely affect any other general metrics on our article page. We wanted to make sure, for example, that this accordion module wasn't detracting from users clicking and engaging with any other part of our article. They wanted to just, we wanted to enhance the article. And so we needed to make sure that it wasn't detracting from it. So in this next slide that I'm about to show you, I'm gonna show you a recording of an anonymous user who interacted with our test. What BWO allows us to do is have these different, you know, anonymous recordings of users that are a part of our testing pool so that we can really get a sense of how they're actually interacting with not only the page that the test is on, but also for us, the testing portion. So in this case, the Q&A accordion. So, as you can see, this user is reading the initial introduction of our article, and they'll scroll down. This is our accordion module. They're opening up, they're seeing what we're providing, and then lastly, they're actually engaging with it and clicking to get to another article. So this is showing us not only that they, yes, are engaging with this module, but they're actually incorporating this into their learnings and clicking to a secondary article, in this case, Anne Hathaway, to learn more about her as well, not just William Shakespeare, but more about William Shakespeare's life, and in this case, wife, Anne Hathaway. Through this BWO test, it was determined that the Q&A accordions were a success. Both variations got A and B got over 20% engagement but it was also further determined that the first variation, the one that had no additional images, was actually the winner. It seemed that users were not really enticed by having visuals, as you would expect. They were more just wanting the answer. It didn't matter to them if there was additional visuals or not. They were simply looking for the facts. Over 23% of users tested clicked open the accordions to see the answers, to the question and also click through to read more of the articles and other related questions. But after we figured out with this Shakespeare article it was a success, we needed to make sure that this same concept, this same accordion module was actually going to work for other articles. What if it only worked on William Shakespeare? What if users on other articles were not wanting this? So to determine whether or not this accordion module was a success for our site and not just that one article, we needed to repeat this test on other articles. So we did a few other tests on articles like our Galileo biography, the Civil Rights Movement event article, World War II, and Alexander Graham Bell. Each of these tests was ran through BWO and they in fact proved the same results. Users were opening up the accordions they liked the accordions, and they actually preferred them without any extra images. These findings gave our team the confidence that we needed. Through surveys, we had identified a user need for quicker content that answered a predetermined question. Free responses, which allowed the users to indicate what questions they were frequently having, allowed us to show that there were very similar questions about a very specific kind of main group of our articles, as you may remember, about biographies, our places, and our different event articles. And through A-B testing through BWO, we found that which design and variation worked best for providing this type of information to our users. All of this research and testing allowed us to see our users in a new way. They had different needs than they had a few years ago. And by acknowledging their influence on our site, we were able to address their needs and find a winning solution for them. After our testing confirmed that the accordions were a solution to this, we then began making these came making these changes to many other of our popular articles in addition to those articles that were ones that the respondents indicated they were coming to most frequently on our site. Here are some examples of the final design and some articles it appears on. 
as you can see in the top, we actually shortened it. And then the final design, we only had three questions instead of five. And we also kind of adjusted some of the treatment to it. Since this testing and since we've rolled out these different accordions to several articles, we have continued to see strong engagement. Users come to Britannica because they trust our content. And amidst all of the innocent information that's swirling around the internet, it's more important than ever that users have the certainty that the information they are going to get is accurate. And our Q&A accordions now give the users the quick facts and answers that they want and they can also be confident that these are, in fact, the right answers and facts. They are accurate and they are backed by a 250-year-old company that knows how to get this done. With the success of our Q&A accordions, we are now already thinking ahead of what can be iterated from this. What are the next ways to continue to provide this sort of content in a way our users would enjoy even more? We've begun future iterations of these Q&A accordions to now see how they can be translated into videos. A handful of these videos are actually already on our most popular articles, in fact, like William Shakespeare, and they're live, that, so users can actually already see them. These new videos are borrowing the basic template of our Q&A accordions by presenting answers to the questions that users want, but in a video format. We are also testing ways to create more jump links in our articles that allow our users to dive even deeper into our content. So much lays ahead of us and our users. Yes, we figured out now what a solution was to our initial discovery of our users' needs, but that can change, and it will. Users, and not just for Britannica.com, but users in general are constantly evolving. And to keep up, we must always test, learn, implement, test, learn, implement. It's continuous. It's a nonstop cycle for us to understand how our users are changing and what their needs are on a day-to-day -day basis. Because with each wave of this, we're gaining more insights into our consumers than we had known before, even with the previous iteration. This helps us make the best Britannica that we can for our users. For 250 years, we have remained the pivotal place of knowledge for students, curious minds, and lifelong long learners. Always extensively fact-checked and content curated from experts around the world, we will always have the facts. Because now, more than ever, facts matter, and Britannica is how you discover them. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was indeed a very insightful presentation. I think uh, I got a lot of uh, new facts about Britannica itself, uh, such as like the one that you have 1 million plus pages. That's humongous amount of content that you're managing. And it's always growing. <laughs> yeah. And also 20 million monthly uniques is a lot of people coming to your site. Mm -hmm. I have a few questions and I think in no particular order, I will throw them at you and have you attempt them one by one. So uh, firstly, I wanted to understand that uh, who is responsible for, uh, you know, making such changes or uh, devising optimization opportunities at Britannica? Is it like the marketing team's KPI or is there a special team in inside of Britannica or it's a, it's a you know, a, a functional team across functions? So it's first and foremost, a collaboration. We work, um, you know, I'm on the marketing team, but we work very closely with product, UX, advertising, everybody. Because our site now, we are a subscription site for the consumer site, which for the main part is actually ad supported, but we also have a subscription site at the business as well, where our users can get to our site unlocked you know if they pay for a subscription they get all of our content ad free they get special features and so because of that we need to make sure that whenever there is a you know an idea be it from the marketing or product team we're not you know necessarily overseeing or sorry there's oversight on what other units within our company need and so it's a constant balance but we also understand that so many 
so many people from our company have amazing ideas. And so we need to just kind of make sure that we are listening to everybody. And then the UX team is crucial too for us because they're someone, you know, that they really know the users as they are on a day-to-day basis and they can help us with the accordion module, make sure that it's presented in a very specific way that users will actually be willing to engage with and it'll be beneficial to them. So it's a cross-functional collaboration. I think that's a very valid point that you make here because uh, I've seen companies struggle with building such sort of an experimentation culture within and with such a huge uh, amount of audiences plus a lot of uh, work that goes into building a Britannica encyclopedia. It's it's really appreciated that you have a cross-functional team doing this. So, yeah, it's, it's crucial. Yeah, from that stems my second question actually that uh, you know you have been uh, using VWO for a long long long, long time now and uh, maybe if you can give me some other examples of where you and your team have used VWO for testing sure so there are several different examples um we can go as simple as one of the times as you may have seen from our videos and our screenshots of our articles all the cross links to other articles within our site are blue so there was one of our early tests with VWO where we wanted to make sure that blue you know, it's a brand color for us, but is it actually something that users, you know, identify as a clickable link? Is there a better color that can even further increase the engagement? So we tried very, very different colors from orange to red to green, you know, lots of different colors. And it turned out, you know, with BWO, we were able to use those heat maps and recordings and understand along with just the regular click engagement no one likes red <laughs> for links. And in fact, blue was the best. So that was one example that, you know, it was a great initial learning for us in terms of using BWO, using BWO, but it also just kind of solidified that we were doing something right, that our color was good, our engagement was strong, and actually it didn't necessarily for this portion of the test matter with an additional color it didn't increase engagement and actually the other colors decreased engagement. So that's one example. And then I, you know, I briefly mentioned the subscription side. So that's another side. Yeah. Where we're able to use PWO to see, you know, messaging value proposition. Can we test, you know, the different subscription calls to action within the article? Is there a better placement on the page? How do we get users into that registration flow? And so we've used BWO in several instances and we're constantly, you know, our roadmap has a lot of different ideas that really make sure that we're, you know, balancing our content with also these great value props of why you should become a subscriber and how is the best way to do that. And whether that is redesigning the button or even redesigning and testing the subscription flow, we've also been using VWO for that. So VWO, you know, we've seen it for us be used in, like I said, very simple kind of just stylistic things to even more extensive to subscription. And then obviously the accordion module, which is a huge, you know, it was a huge growth for us within the product. All right. Uh, coming to the uh, same test that you spoke about, how how did you qualify which pages do you want to attack first in terms of testing? Uh, what was the metric that you use uh, to decide which pages to go after first? Yeah, so I think the first the first way we decided was actually based on our survey respondents. So our survey survey users had indicated you know several different questions, but we were also able to see which article they visited. And from there, we found, you know, about 20 articles that had, you know, about 80% of those survey respondents were going to. So that was our first step. And then the next one is we wanted to make sure that we were hitting an article that had a lot of traffic naturally. And so that we could get a lot of users that came from a variety of different, um, you know, intents, whether they were coming for school or for business so because first we wanted to see, you know, based on the survey, these were the 20 or so articles that were most common. 
Then we wanted to check our analytics and see what page view numbers matched with those articles. And so we were best from that to determine which articles we should tackle first. So William Shakespeare of the articles we tested had the most traffic. And, you know, it's one that so many people come to for so many different reasons. They want to know how he died. They want to, you know, prepare for a speech or a, a paper. So we knew we would get a very diverse testing pool. Yeah, the bar trumps it all, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. uh, Elizabeth, you briefly mentioned and I think you touched upon in your last answer about you having a roadmap in place. Oh, which is another interesting thing that I would really want to know. How did you, you know, A, come up with building this roadmap and B, were there any challenges that you faced in creating such a roadmap? Yeah, so we, you know, obviously there's one person who kind of decides, like, I'm going to start this and tackle it. And then from there, once that framework is set up, we've tried to implement uh, kind of meetings that, we have where we have different people from product, UX, et cetera, to come together to then see what do we want to test? What have we noticed from analytics? What have we noticed from just word of mouth on social media? Anything that we can see, maybe we should try and test that, you know, or maybe this isn't working for us anymore. And so from there, we kind of just, you know, brainstorm, put everything out, and then it's a matter of prioritization seeing, you know, what amount of effort is behind each test, what will it involve, is the timing right, when should we, you know, we're, for the consumer site, we tend to see more traffic in um, the fall, so is it best to test then, do we want to test in a lower traffic month, so it's, it's a lot of um, consideration for a lot of different factors, so that's why we kind of make sure we try and build out a roadmap that can really, um, allow us to always have something in queue to start testing and exploring. But obviously there are ones that kind of are one ups where just they come about and we're like, oh, we need to get that tested now or we need to see what's happening now. So it's a little bit of a roadmap and a little bit of, we just kind of see how things are going. Quite interesting. Uh, this is another thing that many companies struggle with, uh, to be very honest. And uh, a lot of stakeholders since a lot of stakeholders are involved in you know bringing them to the same desk and then having them chart this roadmap out uh, i mm -hmm. think you guys are doing a commendable job out there well thank you very much uh, uh one last question actually a couple more but one of the important <laughs> questions out here uh, you briefly touched upon being ahead of the customer or being ahead of your consumers you know uh, mm -hmm. and one more th one thing that has been now being discussed across digital circles social groups linkedin etc is voice being the next search you know yeah. and uh, i just want to know what is happening at encyclopedia britannica when it comes to voice or you know recognizing mm -hmm. voice search as the next big thing uh so we are definitely trying to understand you know the voice search specific kind of realm um, but what I can talk about and share with regards to voice is one thing that we have launched is our kind of first step into it is actually an Amazon Alexa skill and a Google Assistant skill. It's called Britannica's Guardians of History. And it's a voice game that is, um, you know, targeted to kids who are, are wanting to learn more about history, but also just any user who's interested in voice kind of game and experience. And this one looks at how the first chapter of it, and which is launched, is about Greece. So ancient Greece, you know, the Olympics, all of that, and it's kind of taking you back into that time period. And you're challenged as the user to understand, you know, and interact with different characters in the platform of how you can kind of save history because there are different like time, you know, breaks that things happen and things aren't going the way you want. So you're able to interact with the, um, the device, learn a lot, and also go into, you can get codes, you're taken and used to our articles, you can go to our sites and get access to all this different, very unique content for this um, Britannica Guardians of History. So that's our big, uh, big one that we just launched about a month ago. And we have certainly lots that are coming more, um, but you'll just have to wait and see. So. Interesting. I think I think this weekend I have a Britannica and chill plan versus a Netflix and chill with this game I'm going to play. <laughs> That'd be great. 
seems very interesting and uh, I'm particularly interested in gre Greek history. So I think it's really a good start for me oh, again. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Elizabeth, a lot of savvy marketers and, you know, professionals are watching this. And this one question is something that, uh, you know, comes to all of us. What are you reading these days? Like, what are the blogs or the books that you are reading right now? Mm -hmm. hmm. So, I mean, from the non-marketer, I have to, I just have to put a plug in for where the crawdads sing. I know it's across all the bestsellers by Delia Owens. It is so good. But I think, you know, one of the other ones is Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. It's a very old book, you know, not, let me correct that, several years, which now in the, you know, marketing world is kind of old. And it's one that you wouldn't necessarily think of as a great book to read because, um, you know, there's not marketing in the title, but Outliers really explores very different ways to think about people and like events and there's a lot that goes into the world of you know who you are and how different people are and how different people think so it just really challenges the way that you think so that you know as marketers you can always kind of try and see from you know every side of something and really make sure that you're being very creative um, as you're trying to you know develop different um, solutions for users so Interesting. Uh, Outliers is one of my, uh, you know, favorite books as well. I am also bent on uh, psychology and how psychology applies a lot to what we do as marketer, marketing professionals. So interesting. I think I'll, I like that book as well. Yeah, revisit it. One last question to sum this up. If our audience wants to connect with you and have some questions, what are the best ways to reach you? Yeah, I am definitely on LinkedIn, um, just Elizabeth Vermansky, you can search me, um, and that's kind of the best way, so please connect, please visit our site, and, you know, definitely explore Britannica Guardians of History, it's a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Thank you so much for this session with us, Elizabeth, today, I think it's been a lovely, lovely session, I hope you had fun also preparing for this session as well. I did, <laughs> it's a great challenge. Yeah, thank you so much once again for your time and uh, uh, lovely talking. Thank you.